Sacred Account Saturday. Uh, welcome, good to see everybody here. So if you're just joining in for the first time, my name is Jerry Feta. Um, you are on Sacred Account Saturday with us. We do this every Saturday. Uh, and so I'm the owner, founder, and CEO of a company called Wealth Dynamics, okay? And um, the purpose of these courses and why we do these every Saturday is to share financial education, okay? So this is being shared on, on Zoom, uh, three or four different Facebook pages, YouTube. Uh, it's going to get turned into a podcast. It's going to be turned into an ebook and sent out. And so we want to take the financial education that I have and that some of you guys have as clients and share that with as many people as possible, right? If you're a client right now, you can probably attest as soon as you learn some of the stuff we're going to cover today, you probably for the first time when you heard it, were like, why didn't I learn about this earlier? I wish someone would have told me, right? And so that's part of my mission. Um, I do know the information. I believe it's an ethical responsibility of mine to share this with as many people as possible. And so that's why I do these every Saturday. On a Saturday, I could be doing other things. Instead, I want to spend this time with you guys, okay? So before we dive into our course today, I do want to cover some uh, ground rules, things we cover every week. Uh, first one is I want you to have a purpose for being here, okay? What's your reason for being here? Why are you here? What are you trying to get out of this? How are you trying to improve your finances with the information you learned today? It's impossible to learn something without knowing why, right? Without knowing how I'm going to use it, why I'm going to use it, how it's going to be applied. Okay. The second thing is I want you to remove the idea that money is difficult to understand. Okay. Money is not difficult to understand. Money is something that, that we are born into, whether we like that fact or not, just like oxygen, gravity, having to eat, having to go to the bathroom, needing to sleep at night. We couldn't like imagine living life, not knowing that she needed to sleep not knowing how to get good sleep. Your life would be terrible, okay? And some of us wonder like, why are we struggling? Well, it's because we're that way with money, okay? We have no idea how money works, but the fact is, is you interact with money more than you sleep, okay? Try going out for an entire day and spending zero. See how hard that is, okay? Try going out and doing something fun with your family and spending zero and see how hard that is, okay? I've been there before. It's not easy and it's not fun, right? So, Finances are part of life. That's something to confront and they're not hard to understand. And so I want to give you permission to learn about finances today. Okay. You can become financially educated. You can be someone that knows about money. You can be somebody that's able to, uh, you know, that's able to um, take the information we're learning today and apply this in your life and win with it. We're having some technical difficulties on Facebook. Let me just see if I can debug this while we're going through this. Um, so you can do those things, but it starts with deciding it's possible. Okay, if I have the mindset that I can't, it's too hard, it's for the experts, it's not for me, uh, I'm not, I'm not you know, sophisticated enough, or I don't have the pedigree or the education, then yeah, I'm not going to learn about finances, right? But I could apply that to anything. That's the same reason when I was a personal trainer, that's the number one reason people didn't go to the gym is they were afraid because it was new. They weren't athletic. They didn't do sports in high school. They were overweight. They were embarrassed. They thought it was for someone different than them. And so they never did it. Right. And so this is actually a barrier. This is why I hit this every week is it starts with you deciding, hey, I'm going to learn about money and I can. And it's not too complicated. It's not too hard. It's something I'm able to do. The second part of this point, and I hit this every week as well, I'm going to repeat it again, is realizing that there's no such thing as knowing it all. OK, no matter how much you've heard about finances, there's always more to learn. OK, this idea that I've, I've heard this before, I've, I've, I've you know, I've, I've been over this. I heard this or whatever, whatever it is that we tell ourselves, that's actually a barrier from learning. Like I'm not going to be able to pick up the information if I don't think I need to use the information because I think I know it all already. Okay. So, so those are three points I like to cover. Um, and then really quick to my staff, if uh, we have Joe on here, I think we're good to share these on um, Facebook, on the sacred account page and on my personal page, if you could. Um, big shout out to Joe. Joe is new on our team. He's in Serbia. Um, he's an awesome, phenomenal staff member. So we've got Joe on here. We've got Rodrigo on here as well. Um, and that's what I, I want to hit next, actually, before we dive into this. Found out about some we, have, uh, we have Joe here and uh, Rodrigo here. Rodrigo is going to be reaching out to you in the chat. Okay. So Joe's helping with fielding comments, uh, making sure we're sharing stuff on social. Rod's here to connect with you. So Rodrigo Torres on my team. Uh, he's in, in Italy right now. He's not able to jump on the call live with us, but he's here. And so he's going to be reaching out to you in the chat. Right. So uh, as you're watching, one of our goals here and one of our main intentions is for you to become a client if you aren't one already. OK, and the way that you're going to do that is you are going to grab a copy of my book. 
It's called Blueprint to Financial Freedom. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here so you can see it. And uh, that's going to be our starting point. Okay, so the way that you're going to do this is if you go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo, you can get a free copy of my book here, Blueprint to Financial Freedom. Okay, so if you grab this, this is going to give you not just what we're going to cover today, it's going to give you the whole thing. Like, here's how you build financial independence. Okay, this is a step by step guide toward achieving passive income that exceeds savings, expenses, and taxes. Guys, we've had we've had people that read this book and they actually don't even reach out to us for help. They just come later and say, hey, I read your book and I used it and I was able to get passive income right away. Right? We have other people that read the book and they come to us right away saying, hey, I would like help. I would like guidance and we're able to help them do that. We just had a client this week. She's been a client maybe six months. Okay, She just bought $150,000 worth of real estate with us. That's going to pay her about fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars a month in passive income. She bought about fifty thousand dollars worth of gold and silver, and she's setting up her second sacred account. Okay, if you don't know what the sacred account is yet, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But she's been a client for literally, guys, like six months. Okay, this doesn't have to take a while. This idea that that you know we we put a little bit of money away and we start early and we give it to Wall Street and we get our four hundred one k match and we put money till we're sixty. Do you realize that the put money away till your 60 plan means it's going to take until you're 60, right? Like that's, that's the, the, the long and short of that. Like, I don't want to wait till I'm 60. I want to be financially independent now, not when I'm 60. Okay. A big part of my story is my mom died when she was 60. I was her financial advisor. Okay. So if you didn't know this about me, I was a licensed financial advisor for many years and I help with what I call retail financial products, the traditional retirement planning. Set up your retirement account, set up your Roth, set up your 401k, contribute to those, right? And you're supposed to be able to take the money out when you're 60 and, and all this great stuff. Well, I did that. I set that up for my mom and she got diagnosed with stage four cancer when she was 60 years old. Six months later, she was dead. Okay, the age that she was supposed to be able to take this money out, right? And so I had to look at that as one of the most important people in my life. That plan didn't work. It unraveled right before my very own eyes. As a 21-year-old, I was, I was not only for my own finances devastated, I was like, I don't want to do that. But this is what I was teaching all of my clients, right? And so I had to look at, okay, I don't want to wait till I'm 60. Okay, who here on the webinar doesn't want to wait till you're 60 till you're financially independent? And if you're already 60, like you don't want to wait till you're 70, 75, 80, like this message of defer this until later well, the thing is, is the people that you're giving the money to in the meantime are using it to build wealth right now. When I put money in a 401k plan, where does that go? That goes to Wall Street. Is Wall Street waiting? No, no, no. They're using that money now to build financial independence for themselves. When I deposit money in a bank account, are they waiting till they're 60? No, they're using that money now to build financial independence for themselves. So why am I not doing the same thing? Right. So as we're going through this today, I want you to think about this. How can I speed things up? Why is this taking so long? And maybe it's not even taking so long for me at a certain point in my life. It wasn't even a plan yet. So it's not even that it was taking a while. It was like, this isn't, is never going to happen because I'm not even trying. I didn't even know it's a possibility. Right. So here's today's topic. And I'm going to teach you guys something very important today. This is what I believe is the make or break point for anybody. Okay. So there's a chart that I'm going to show you to start things off today that really put this into perspective. I saw this probably when I was 22, 23 years old. Okay, when I was 22, 23 years old, I saw this. And, and this changed the game for me with finances. It was something that I never looked at money the same. Um, and, and with this, I'm going to show you how you can get into the top 1% of wealth now. Okay, not something you have to wait for, not something you do later at some, some obscure time in the future. Like, how do you get into the top 1% of wealth right now? Okay, because that's, that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I want to teach you to do as well. So let me find this chart really quick so I can share with you exactly what I mean. Ah, here we go. All right, so this chart breaks down savings rates by wealth class. Okay, and some of you have maybe seen this before, but this was something that for me, when I saw this, everything clicked, right? It simplified so much for me. Okay. So I'm just going to draw on this as we kind of talk through it. So we have three different classes of wealth. We have the top 1% of wealth. We have the next 9% spread, 10 to 1%. Then we have the bottom 90%, right? So 
This is savings rates by wealth class. Savings rate by wealth class. We're looking at a couple of, of uh, different time periods. We're going from 1913 until 2012, 2013. So it's a hundred year period. For those of you that are, are maybe more um, grouped in as clients, you probably know the significance of what happened in 1913 and why we're starting in that time period. In 1913 was the creation of the, the Federal Reserve Bank. Okay, the, 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 the Central Bank of the United States of America, the Federal Reserve Bank, it's a private institution. It's not a bank. It loans money to our U.S. Treasury. Uh, and it is the basis of all financial slavery that exists. And yes, I use the word slavery very specifically. We're not literally in chains and, and locks and balls and cages anymore. But financially, we are. Okay, I can't tell you how many people that are, are enslaved to a bank on a credit card that they can't keep up with right now, or they're enslaved to their mortgage, or they're enslaved to have to trade their time for money at a job because they've got all these bills and obligations, right? So when we look at this chart, I want you to keep in mind, this is from 1913. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Bank was created and also income tax in the United States of America was made legal, even though it's unconstitutional. Same year, okay? All the way through, right? So let's check this out. Bottom 90%. Let's do a reality check on this too. When I first looked at this chart, guys, the first thing I thought was bottom 90%. I was like, oh, that's the poor people, right? Because bottom, I saw the word bottom. And I was like, wait, wait, this is 90%. So this is also like the top 10 to 1% spread here. This would be like the top 11 to 20% spread here. This is upper middle class. This includes you. This includes at the time me. This includes most of America. Right. So to give you an example, to be in the top 1%, you need to have at least a $10 million net worth. Okay, to be in the top 10%, you need to be usually about a million plus net worth. And so this is anything probably less than a million. Anyone that's not a millionaire pretty much falls into this bottom 90% category. That could mean you have 800 grand into your net worth, or it could mean you're, you're negative, right? But this is savings rates by wealth class, okay? So check this out. Top 1% first. They're saving consistently about 40% of their income. Okay, this was the first thing I saw and it blew my mind because I was like 40%, that's a big number. Like I was a financial advisor teaching people to do 10 to 15%. I was like, if you could put 10 to 15% 10 to of your income away for retirement, you can be financially independent, right? That was my message. You can be financially independent, you can retire. Now, what if I instead did 40 instead of 10? Like if 10%, think about this, if 10% saved or invested of my income will get me to retirement by age 65, what if I saved four times the money? Logic stands to reason that I would get there four times faster, right? So if I'm 30 and I start saving 10% of my income and it's going to help me retire when I'm 65, right? That's like 35 years away, okay? So what if I were to do that four times faster? Okay, so if I look at this, okay, well, I do I do four times faster. Okay, that's uh, about 10 years. I could be financially independent. Starting from zero, if I could get to this 40% rule, I could be financially independent in the next 10 years. Now, there's other things I'm going to have to do after, but my point here is do this first. Get here first, right? Because this is the thing that's going to get you there, and it's the thing that's going to keep you there. And if you ever go backwards, it's going to get you back there. The only time I don't make progress is when I stop doing this, right? So, so if I invested, and I'm pretty open about this, I lost some money with investments last year, okay? First time ever, it sucked. I, I, I had to look at, okay, what happened, right? And so in the midst of that, when I lost money, I went into kind of this fear mode because I put money into an investment. I followed all the rules, right? And somehow I still lost. I'm gonna teach you guys something extra on this today. But the thing that brought me back immediately was, okay, I need to go increase my savings rate again. I'm, I'm, I'm going to worry about recouping some of the money later as that comes up. But in the meantime, what are the things that got me there in the first place? Earning and saving. Good. I'm going to go earn more income. I'm going to get my 40% savings. I'm going to make sure I'm doing that stuff because whether or not that money comes back, I'm going to rebuild anyways. Now, if I can't do that, if I don't know how to go save 40% of my income, then yeah, I'm going to hang out in, in, in last year and in the past. And 10 years from now, I'll still be telling the story of how I lost some money. And that's why I never became as wealthy as I wanted to. 
Or I can say, hey, I'm going to say 40% like I know the wealthy would. Because they're doing this at the top 1%. But guys, what this chart doesn't show you is this also is how they got to the top 1%. They're not saving 40% because they're one percenters. That's how they got there. And then they kept in the successful behavior. Think about the gym. I'm, an, I'm really into fitness as well. The, the practices that I have to get in shape, I used to do bodybuilding. So I would diet down. I would get my six pack, all this stuff to get a six pack and keep it. It's the same behavior to get there. There are certain things I've got to eat exercise. I have to do, you know, nutrition supplements. Once I get there, I have to still do the same stuff to keep it. Does that make sense? It didn't change, right? Like I have to do the same stuff to keep it. And actually like, sometimes I have to do more to keep it to stay in that condition. Now, if I ever go backwards and I start pigging out, gaining weight, if I wanted to get back there, it wouldn't be any different. I would have to go back to the things I did to get there in the first place. Do you see that? So I'm telling you with this, saving 40% of your income is the first thing. So here's, here's what I want to point out on this. Now, you look at some, there's some dips here, right? So it dips 1920 to 1929. 1929, who knows what that was? Okay, that was the stock market crash. The savings rate went down. Okay, we look at 1930 through 1939. It not only dipped, guys, but it went into the negative. This is zero. They went into a negative savings rate, which means they were actually spending more than they were earning. They were negative. They were borrowing money. Okay, I want you to think about what this means because I made a mistake when I looked at this chart for the first time. I thought, damn, these guys got hit hard. They're no longer saving. That sucks to be them. But then I had to realize, no, 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 that doesn't make any sense. The stock market crashes, so they quit saving. Like, why are those things linked? It's like, like my savings rate doesn't go up and down with the stock market. They stopped saving on purpose. Not only that, they had a ton of money here. They were saving 40% of their income. Then they nosedive and they start borrowing money. What's happening here? Okay, I looked at this and realized they're buying stuff on sale. They're buying businesses. They're buying real estate. They're buying investments during one of the greatest sales of the last century. That's why they're borrowing money. Everything was cheap. The stock market crashes. If they want to go buy large shares of companies at a very steep discount, that's the time to do it. That's the time to buy the real estate. That's the time to buy the small business they're looking at. That's the time to buy their competitors out. That's the time to hire people. But I can't do that if I don't have reserves, right? So lesson one, save 40% of my income. Lesson two, keep it store the value so that when I'm ready to invest and the timing is right, I can go in and I can, I can win. Okay. Now check out what happens here. This ends, the great depression ends, boom, they go up not only to 40%, but this is the highest ever above 40%. They're probably 42, 43% right there. Okay. Again, here, they dip down a little bit. 1950, this was a recession. That was FDR, right? Boom. Then they're right back up. 1970s, there was another one. Okay, boom, they're right back up again. The 90s and, and the end of the 90s, the tech bubble, right? They're down. Mortgage crisis, they're down, right? Uh, and then they're right back up again. And I can guarantee if this chart went on, okay, we go down to 2020, they probably went down again. And now they're back up, right? So, so what this teaches me and what I learned when I looked at this chart was this is the behavior that I need to model with my finances. Now we can look at the next couple of groups here. Okay, the top 10 to 1%, right? So this is anyone that has basically between a one to $10 million net worth. So these are not like we're talking about broke people. These are still like this, that's a significant amount of money. Okay, so top 10 to 1%, they did okay, right? They're doing some of the same trends. They come down, they come down, they're kind of modeling it. But I want you to see the difference here. The 1950s, these guys bubbled down. They kept their discipline in and they said, we're going to go invest. These guys didn't really. They tried to hold on. Okay. Who's ever had this happen where, where something happens that's scary and instead of expanding, you freeze. You contract. You're like, I'm afraid to invest. I'm, I'm afraid to spend the money. I'm afraid to, to put the money into my sacred account because I feel more comfortable when it's with my bank. And so you actually freeze and you don't follow the blueprint. You don't follow the plan. Okay. I want to show you what happens. They did this. 
They tried to maintain their status quo versus these guys. They said, nope, this is a recession. We're going to go all in and we're going to buy things on sale again. Okay. The recession ends. They go back up to 40%. These guys go down. Okay. This is the difference. This is the difference between someone that makes it in the top 1% and someone that doesn't. Okay. Emotional control and discipline to follow the plan, even when times are tough. Right. So these guys, they could have probably got into the top 1% here. They would have went just boom, right? Instead of going down here, they would have went boom down here and they would have come up and they would have kept the trend. But you can see from this point onward, they go downward the entire time and they're never on the same track. They're actually matching more of the trend of the bottom 90%. Okay, saving money. Saving money is an indicator of behavior. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you why. When I earn income, that's also an in indicator of behavior. I'm adding value to other people. I'm helping. I'm passionate about that. I'm, I'm, I'm making sure that others are benefiting. And so the income shows up. That's behavior. Once I get that money, you can show me where your finances go, and I can tell exactly where you're going to end up in life. Okay, if you're not paying yourself first, you're not going to be wealthy. If you're paying banks, Wall Street, and the IRS first, you're going to stay in the middle class. If you're if you're spending money on you know fast food and movie tickets and, and and luxury items to basically entertain yourself and numb your mind, you're probably not even going to be middle class. You're going to slowly become poor, right? If you're not investing in yourself and and spending money on things like personal development and financial education, I can tell that that person is not going to become wealthy. Okay, show me your schedule and show me your accounting statements, and I can predict your future. Okay, these guys, if we looked at their accounting statement, they try to keep the money with the banks. Okay, they try to keep the money in their retirement account, in their investments, instead of saying, I'm going to go acquire and expand. Right now, here's the thing that's the most concerning to me. We can beat up on these guys all we want, but the reality is most of the people that are going to watch this are not even in the top 10 to 1%. We're in the bottom 90. The bottom 90 didn't do shit. Okay, like, like they didn't even experience like the Great Depression. Prior to that, they were only saving like 3% of their income anyways. They dropped from three to zero, like big deal. Nothing really changed there. Okay, uh, again, like they kind of all went up a little bit here during this period. But again, at the very best, they're saving like 5% of their income. They maintain that pretty much all the way through. They bump up a little bit, right? Boom, boom. They're saving still about 5 6% of their income. Early 2000s tech bubble. This is where they had to borrow money. The reason why they had to borrow money is because prior, they slope all the way down. They didn't have any money. They put everything into stock. They put everything into the house. Tech bubble happens. Boom. Retirement accounts liquidated. It's gone. It's cut in half. Immediately following mortgage crisis happens. And these guys are just trying to simply survive. They're putting money on credit cards to pay the grocery bill. Okay, which is different than here. This is borrowing money to acquire income producing assets. These guys weren't acquiring income producing assets during that time. Right? So it's a very different story. And so what I want to do is I want to challenge anyone that's watching today. The way that you become a top one percenter is actually first by saving like one. Okay, and I'm going to share with you what I mean here. Okay, so saving like a top one percenter in order to, to become financially independent, I have to do three things. And I talk about this all the time. It's called the triangle of wealth. I need to earn. I need to save. And I need to invest. Right? So to be in the top 1% for income, I believe you need to have like 500K or more in annual income. Right? So if I'm the average American where I'm making 50, 60K, I'm not saying you're not going to make 500K, but I'm saying that that's going to take a little bit. It's not going to happen probably next year. And you're going to build up to that over time. And some people may never actually get there, right? So I don't necessarily need to become top 1% in earned income. Okay, what about investments? With investments to be a top 1%er, we just said, okay, we need to have $10 million in net worth. Right. So I believe everyone can get here. There's no reason anyone watching this should not become worth $10 million or more in their lifetime. Zero reason other than they don't know how to. Okay. They're not, they, they don't have the knowledge. They have some sort of disability where they can't, like it prevents them from doing it or they're not willing to. Okay. Do I have the know how? Do I have the willingness? Do I have the ability? And if I have all three of those things, then there's no reason why. 
Bill Gates, at, at the time he had this quote, he was the wealthiest man in the world. And he said, if you're born poor, it's not your fault. If you stay poor, it is. Okay, guys, I make a lot of income from this. Like literally from a smartphone. I know people that have the same smartphone and they use it for different stuff and it costs them money. It doesn't bring them any income. I'm not special. I grew up in Alaska. I had, I had 60 kids in my graduating class. I didn't go to college. But do you realize where I lived is not even part of the continental United States? Like, it's not like I could drive to the next, you know, the next state over and network. No, it's, I basically was in America's Russia. Okay, like that's, that's like, that's, that's a disadvantage. So I'm saying for me, divorced parents, C average student, didn't go to college, literally lived disconnected from the, the, the continental US. Okay, I didn't inherit money. I didn't, I wasn't born with money. We were poor. Like we got free food from the church. We went and got free lunches from school. I rode the bus to school every day. Like that whole thing. I watched bugs crawl through my food. My mom said, eat it anyways. I had that kind of childhood. For me to get here is because of one thing, my savings rate. When I duplicated, I need to save 40% of my income. I realized I can do that now. Okay, I can't do this one maybe right away. I can't do this one maybe right away, but I sure as hell can do this one. Right. And I want to break down the math on this. So check this out. If I make 10K a month and I say 40% of that, that means that I save $4,000 a month. Right. So on that 10, if I subtract out 4,000, I've got six left. Right, so now let's look at, okay, well, well, I've got six left to cover everything. What about taxes? Okay, so let's say on 10 grand, I'm in a 25% tax bracket and I need, I need to pay $2,500 in taxes. Right, so that brings me down to now 6,000 minus 2,500. That brings me down to 3,500 bucks left to pay for everything. Right. So if I have a housing cost or a mortgage, let's say that that's two grand a month. Okay. I now have 1500 bucks to cover everything. Groceries, gas, health insurance, right? This is tight on a $10,000 a month income. This is very tight, right? So there's two things I can do here. The first one is I can increase my income. Everyone can, should, and needs to increase their income. There's no reason not to. Right, just do more of what you already do to increase the income. There's no shortage of income. Like, like this is this is this is why with my staff, I, I'm so appreciative of them because they're appreciative of them because they're 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 willing to work on a weekend. Doesn't matter because they're like, yeah, I want to earn more income. Cool. That means we work on a Saturday or a Sunday sometimes. Right. That means we put in some hours late. Like that's how I got to where I'm at. Is I work like 90 hours a week for a very long time. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that because, again, I'm trying to become financially independent in the next 10 years. If I'm starting this plan, that's my goal. 10 years from now, I want to be financially independent where my passive income exceeds my savings, expenses, and taxes. Right. Now, it would be a different story if I was going to do this for 40 years. Yeah. 90 hours a week for 40 years is probably not good for me and my family, whatever. But me doing this for the next five or 10 years so that I can be free forever, that totally makes sense to me. Okay, so I need to increase my income. So instead of 10, I need to go bump that up to maybe 12 or 15 or 20. That's the first thing. But the second thing is, and this is where we aren't taught well, is, okay, first, first, let's stop giving money to Wall Street. Okay, so the 401k plan. Most people are doing a 3% match on that that comes right off their paycheck. They never see that income. So 3% of 10 grand, that's 300 bucks a month. If I cancel the 401k, I'm going to get a pay raise of $300 a month, okay? Let's say I, I have a car payment. I get rid of my car payment. That's another 500 bucks a month. I use my sacred account like we teach to self-finance my car, right? Uh, next big one is gonna be housing. I have a housing payment. I have a mortgage. I switch that over to a first position home equity line of credit and I run the replace your mortgage strategy with that and I can pay my home down and off in five to seven years. I can reduce my housing payment and so I could go from, from you know, probably a $2,000 housing payment to maybe a thousand or 1500. So I'm gonna save another thousand bucks a month there. Okay, so just right here, I freed up $1,800 a month. 
that's going to help me save four grand. Now, what about taxes? You can work with us on taxes. So then we can do things like funding a self-directed IRA or setting up a family management entity, entity for your kids so you can pay them and reduce your taxes or all sorts of HSAs that we use, tax planning strategies, turnkey real estate for depreciation. And we could get rid of this 2,500 a month completely. Okay, so let's do the math on this. 1,800 plus 2,500 is 4,300. We just found your 40% right there. Right? It's there. I can do this like, like, like clockwork, time after time after time after time with clients over and over and over because it's that proven. That's, that's, that's the system we use. So go increase your income and then come work with us so we can help you find the 40%. Now, here's the thing with the 40% is there's three places we should never put this money. We should never put your 40% with Wall Street. We should never put your 40% with banks. And we should never put it with the IRS. Okay, and this is the three places, unfortunately, that most people put their money with Wall Street. It's the 401k, it's the IRA, it's, it's just the mutual fund or the index fund that they're putting money into because Warren Buffett said so, even though he does something entirely different with his money. Okay, so we don't want to put money with Wall Street. Same thing with banks. I don't want to put my money in a checking account. Okay, if I have money in a checking account, that means I am financially illiterate. It's the financial equivalent of eating at McDonald's. The only reason you do it is because it's fast and convenient, even though it's killing you. Okay, when I save money in a bank, they're taking my deposit, right? They're taking my deposit. They're not sticking it in a vault and waiting till I come back. They're actually paying me 0.01% interest, which is nothing. It's going to take me 720,000 years to double my money at that rate. They're then taking the money that I deposited and they're loaning and investing 100% of it. They're loaning it out to people on their mortgage, their car payment, their credit card. They're investing it in Forex. They're investing it with stocks. They're investing it in options. They're making infinite returns. That's why we call it infinite banking because the banks are doing it to you already, making infinite returns on your savings accounts. And they're putting my money at risk and I get nothing for that. And then they get, they get in financial trouble in 2008. They, the banks caused 2008, guys. What happened in 08? They all got the bailouts. What happened in 2020? They all got the bailouts. We got, we got what, 1,200 bucks? 1200 bucks and it wasn't even a gift. It was now your, your tax credit's going to be reduced next year when you file. Okay, the average corporation got six grand. Okay, you'll see banks and, and corporations on, on that list that got hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in COVID stimulus money in 2020, right? So we don't want to give money to banks. The other one is the IRS. We don't want to give money to the IRS. If we're overpaying in taxes and getting a tax refund, Okay, you're, you're literally like you're letting yourself get stolen from. You're extending an interest-free loan to the IRS for 12 months, letting them pay you back at the end of the year with nothing in return. You get no exchange out of that. And then you're celebrating like, yippee, I got a tax refund, right? So instead of this, there's three places that I would save money in instead, right? So instead of Wall Street banks and the IRS, we call this tier one, tier two. And tier three, these are the three places I would be saving money, okay? Tier one, this is the sacred account life insurance. Okay, this is a life insurance policy, right? So the number one owner and purchaser of this exact type of life insurance policy are actually the largest banks in the US. There's over 3,000 banks that, that use the exact strategy that I'm about to describe to you, over $200 billion in cash value collectively. Right now, why is it that they're using this? And then, like, I talked to someone the other day, and he's like, he's like, okay, I'm interested, but how come more people don't know about this? Okay, it's not about how many people know about it, it's about who knows about it. Right. So I look at this and I'm saying, okay, good. Like, my sister doesn't know about it, my brother in law doesn't know about it, but freaking Jamie Diamond, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase Bank, does. I don't care what my brother-in-law is doing. I want to know what Jamie Dimon's doing. Bank of America has $22 billion in life insurance cash value. Do I really care what my cousin at Thanksgiving thinks about my life insurance policy? Hell no. I think about what Bank of America is doing because they're a billion-dollar corporation. Okay, the opinion of the, of the guy that doesn't know about the life insurance does, doesn't matter. Right? So I want to look at what are the wealthy doing. So the sacred account works like this. 
This is why I put money here instead of the bank. Right. So when I put money in a bank, we just describe this. So let's split the screen in half. I put a dollar into a bank account. We're going to call this their bank because this is truly their bank. We're putting money into their bank, whether that's Bank of America or Chase or Wells Fargo or whoever. Speaking of Wells Fargo, who saw that Wells Fargo just paid like $3 billion in fines and they were still profitable, like their stock still went up? And this is the second time they've done stuff like this, where they open up accounts in people's names that aren't real and they commit fraud and it doesn't matter to them. So not only are they like taking our money and loaning it out without our permission, and they really do have your permission because you sign for that when you sign up for a bank account, you just don't know that that's what you're signing up for, but they're not very upfront about it. Like when you go in there and you don't think about like, how do they pay for this expensive building? Oh, we loaned out your deposits and made billions of dollars and paid you nothing and kept the profit. They're not upfront with you on that. So you did sign, you did give them permission, right? But on top of that, add insult to injury, then they're like, cool, let's also open up false checking accounts in his name and charge overdraft fees and account opening fees that he didn't agree to either and make billions of dollars doing that too. Like, when are we gonna, it's like being in an abusive relationship. When are you gonna get out of the relationship? You're getting beat, leave. You don't have to stay there. That's not good for you. It's not helping. No, there's no benefit. There's no exchange. Leave. Right? I have goals. This isn't helping me with my goals. It should be that simple. I care enough about myself, enough about my family, enough about my clients, enough about my staff that when I see a situation like that happening with my finances, I leave. I don't make sense of it. I don't talk about, oh, well, here's the the good that, that, that makes sense of the bad. No, there is bad. There is a turd in the pool I'm not getting in. You can tell me how much good water is still left, but there's freaking, you know, a Mars bar floating in there. I'm not getting in the swimming pool. There's no reason to make sense of that. So leave, quit giving money to the bank, quit giving money to Wall Street. They take advantage of you. They steal from you. They commit fraud with with your money and then you bail them out. When they got bailed out in 2008 from literally rigging the banking system and the mortgage system, crashing the market, losing half your 401k, getting your house foreclosed on, The bailout money came from your taxpayer dollars. They robbed you blind and then you paid for their rehabilitation, which then they took and paid themselves bonuses with. They didn't fix the scenario. They didn't fire the people. They didn't look at, oh, what happened here? They said, no, let's stick this money in our pockets too. Okay, the net worths of the top 1% in 2020 went up to a trillion dollars a gain. They gained a trillion dollars in 2020. What happened to you in 2020? Think about it. You got locked in your house. Some of you were told you couldn't go to work. You were forced to get shots you didn't want to get. You couldn't go places. You couldn't see friends and family. You couldn't travel. Meanwhile, these guys, they they added a trillion dollars to their net worth. Okay, this is not a rig. This is the the rig game. It's not a fair system. And we can sit there and whine about it and say, this is not fair. There's wealth inequality. It's because of skin color, or it's because of gender, or it's because of socioeconomic status. No, it's because one group does what I'm saying today, and the other group doesn't. And this isn't my advice. I'm copying the group. The group that added a trillion dollars to their net worth, we're copying them. We're saying, what do they do? Let's just copy them. It's not like we're coming up with this crazy method, and it's complicated and difficult. So we need to get rid of that. The other thing we need to get rid of, and I know I'm on a tangent here, but I want to finish this up is you need to stop watching the news. That's never going to help you. Thinking about how the world's going to end and how the central bank's taking over and you know Hans, whatever his name is, over in Germany with his naked rat pet you know, is, is, is doing the new world order. Like That can't help you. That's not going to earn more income for you. That's not going to add more savings to your bank. That's not going to grow your net worth. Okay, If the world's going to be taken over, you better have assets when it happens. You better have means. You better have real assets. And that's why I tell you, don't save in the bank. The dollar, if it becomes worthless, you don't want dollars, right? Like like if if the market crashes, you don't want to be in stocks, right? My life insurance will still be there. It's been through four or five different currency changes. It's been through every economic crash since the Civil War and never lost money. I trust that, right? My gold and silver that I save in, it's been there for 6,000 years. Like Like the gold that we have today is the gold that King Solomon had way back in the Bible. It's still the same stuff. Gold is indestructible. It's been a store of value for 6,000 years. 
It's not going anywhere. The real estate, there's been real estate for thousands of years as well. The idea of someone living in a property goes all the way back to probably predating gold, right? We had to have shelter and structure, okay? We're opening up a new line called Philanthro Investors where we're gonna be investing in water. We're gonna be investing in education. We're gonna be investing in, in cleaning up the trash off the planet, bettering conditions. All this stuff is vital. I want to own assets that are vital. So it doesn't matter what the economic condition is. People need water. People need shelter, right? So all that to say, like unplug from the stuff that's hurting you. Like if you watch the news and you feel terrible and you feel scared and you feel worried after, that's not good for you. Just like if you eat food and you feel like crap after, quit eating what just made you feel like crap. If you put money in a system and you leave with the same or less money, it's not good for you. Don't keep doing the same thing, okay? Like, like there's a certain point where we can give you the education and, and, and the tools and the tricks. If you keep doing the same stupid stuff that doesn't work, we can't help. The sacred account can't help someone that's still gonna give all their money to Wall Street. It can't help someone that's still gonna overspend. They can't help someone that doesn't go earn more income. It can't help someone that's not gonna spend time learning about it so they can use it, okay? So we put a dollar in their bank. Them being all the people I just mentioned, because it's all connected, the banks, Wall Street, the news, the pharmaceutical companies, the politicians, they're all working for the same guy or guys, however you want to look at it. They're on the same team, right? So we put money in here. What happens? They pay me 0.01%. They loan out 100% of my money. When I pull the money out with withdrawals, I get no growth. There's fees, there's charges, and there's also fraud. And it will take me seven hundred and twenty thousand dollars or seven hundred twenty thousand years to double my money with this. That's what happens when I put a dollar in their bank. You show me the benefit. Oh, but I I know them. I've seen their commercials. Yeah, the ones they paid for with the money they got from the fraud. Oh, I trust them. Why? Wells Fargo just did $3 billion in fines for breaking the law. JP Morgan paid $2 billion in fines in 2020 for rigging the silver market. Okay, in, in 2018 or 19, there was a, a ship in Chicago, I believe, that was uh, caught by the FBI with some of the largest possessions in history of cocaine and the ship was financed by bank of or it was financed by JP Morgan Chase Bank. You trust them because you see their building? Guys, that's McDonald's. Just because you see a bunch of McDonald's doesn't mean it's a trustworthy organization you should eat the food of. You're going to get sick and die if you eat McDonald's. Right? Once in a while, okay, yeah, fine. Have a burger and fries, but if that's your staple, you're going to get sick and die. Once in a while, if you need to use a bank product, okay, I understand. You got to put some money in checking to pay rent and buy a beer. I got it. But if that's your staple, financially, you're going to get sick and die. You won't flourish and prosper because the bank is at your cost. Okay. So when I put a dollar in my bank, here's what happens instead. Okay. One dollar in my bank. I'm going to earn three to 5%, right? I have guarantees against growth and loss. Guaranteed growth. My money can't be taxed. I am protected from creditors. Lawsuits. My privacy is protected. Some more benefits I'm going to list off here. My money is fully allocated. What does fully allocated mean? Fully allocated means they're not loaning out any of my money. The dollars that I have in my cash value are actually there, which is how it should be. The money is literally there with the insurance company. They're not doing fractional reserve banking. Okay, fully allocated. I get a death benefit. I made an owner in the insurance company. Guys, imagine if you set up a bank account and they're like, cool, you now own the bank. You, you'd be like, what? 
Like, oh, how many more accounts can I open up? I want to open up as many accounts as I can and as many banks as I possibly can because I want to own them all. That doesn't happen. With a life insurance policy, it does. Realize I didn't say this is a life insurance policy till just now because it really doesn't matter. If you can make three to 5% instead of 0.01%, is that better? Yes or yes. Okay, guaranteed against loss. Guaranteed growth, not taxable. This money here, this piddly little 0.01% interest is still taxable. So not taxable versus taxable, which one you, would you pick? Okay, protected from creditors, lawsuits, and privacy protection versus with the bank, they are the creditor. They can actually garnish from your bank account. If you get sued, they can actually be involved and take the money out. They report all your transactions to the Federal Reserve and the IRS anyways. You have zero privacy. So do you want protection on all these categories or literally have them ratting out on you over here on these three categories? Fully allocated versus 100% unallocated. Death benefit or no death benefit. Being an owner in the company versus literally being the thing they suck the life out of to stay in business. Which one would you pick? This isn't a theory. I'm telling you right now, you could be picking this one. If you don't have a sacred account, then you're currently picking this model. You are current and you can't even blame them. You're doing it to yourself at this point. At the minute you know that this is an option and you don't do it, you are actually doing this to yourself now. Okay, prior to this webinar, I'm sorry to tell you, you had the excuse. I didn't know. It's not my fault. I was never told. I was never warned. No one ever shared this with me. I didn't know better. Now you know better. So are you going to keep doing the thing that's going to keep you financially enslaved? Or are you going to switch over to a system that not only is better, guys, these guys use it. The number one owner and user of this strategy right here is the banks. 3,000 or, or more banks have, a, have their, their tier one capital in a whole life insurance policy. That's over $200 billion in cash value collectively. They're the number one owner and the number one purchaser of this exact kind of life insurance. If you can't beat them, join them. Do the thing they're doing. Like this isn't hard. Just cut out the middleman. What are you putting in the bank every month for savings? Stop doing that and put it in a sacred account. What are you giving to Wall Street every month right now? Stop doing that. Put it in a sacred account. What are you speculating on on invisible crypto tokens? Stop doing that every month and put that in a sacred account. Right? If I don't do this, then I never get started. I never get started because I don't actually have the money to invest. To invest in a real estate deal with us, guys, it takes at least 50 grand. The first one's the hardest to go from zero to 50. After that, it gets easier and easier every time. Most people in, in, in without the system we're talking about today will never have $50,000. They will blow it. They will either blow it when they save it or they'll never save it up in the first place. Okay, and I'm speaking from firsthand experience. It wasn't until I learned about the sacred account that I actually felt like I had an incentive to save money. Why would I want to put money here? Over here on this left-hand side with these terrible benefits where I'm literally being taken advantage of, why would I want to save any money when this is what's going to happen? It's like I'm being penalized for doing the right thing. Imagine dieting where you actually gain weight. You would be like, why would I diet? If I'm going to gain weight, why would I diet? There's no point in that. Imagine going to the gym and getting fatter. You would be like, yeah, the gym's already hard and it's making me fat also. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. So this is the equivalent, save money and actually end up worse. No, I don't want to save money, right? Like when you penalize a good activity, you actually disincentivize the population from doing it, right? This is what I had in high school. I got good grades and then they'd give me the next test in the next advanced class without telling me how, how to do it, why I'm doing it. It disincentivized me from passing the test anymore because I was like, I don't want this anymore. I don't want another test. I don't want another class that I don't know why I'm taking it. So I'm just going to stop passing them. That was my solution in the moment. Is that a responsible solution? No. Would I recommend for my godson, hey, go fail your test and they stop giving you good ones? No, I would say do your best in school. But the difference is I want to know him. I want him to know why. Here's the purpose. Right? When you're saving, I want you to know why and what's the purpose. Which leads me to my last point before we wrap up today. Okay. The purpose of saving money is, is a couple of different things. Okay. The first one is to invest in yourself. Okay. I would save money up to then get rid of it, to invest in myself, to take a course, to, to grow my income, to grow my skill sets, to remove mental blocks. Okay. I don't talk about this enough, but guys, I'm huge on investing in myself. Okay. I put well over $200,000 into improving me. 
Okay, and I'm not talking about clothes. This jacket I'm wearing was probably like 20 bucks. But I'm talking about actual personal development. How do I improve as a being? Okay, if I don't invest in myself, that speaks volumes about the confidence that I have in my ability to go produce, in my ability to help people, in my ability to grow, in my ability to get through tough times. For those of you that are worried about, oh, the world's going to end and, and, and um, you know, the, 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 the New World Order guy, I forget his name, Hans, Charles, whatever it is, the, the naked cat dude, this guy, right? Like you're worried about that. If that happens, the thing that is going to make you make it or break it in that environment is your skill sets. Okay, how able am I? How good am I at helping people? How good of a communicator am I? How many people know who I am? Right, because I have to rebuild. That's what that is, rebuilding. If I have to rebuild, those are the things I need to have. Why not invest in those? So if I'm saving, I'm saving to invest in myself. Okay, that's my skill sets, my abilities, my financial literacy. That's one of the main reasons I would save money. Okay, the second thing I would save for is to self-finance large purchases. Self-finance large purchases, right? So self-financing a large purchase, I bought a, a Tempur-Pedic mattress. This is like a $4,000 mattress. By the way, I didn't pay four grand for it. I paid two. Okay, I'll talk about that another time. I got 50% off on a brand new mattress because again, skill sets. I've invested in myself enough to know how to ask the right questions, how to negotiate, how to say the right things and, and get things like that. On top of that, I self-financed that. I used my sacred account. So instead of having a, a car payment or a mattress payment or you know a furniture payment or a college loan payment, I would save money up in my sacred account to self-finance those things so that I'm the bank. I make money on those transactions. Okay, so that's the second thing I would save money for. The third thing is to invest in income-producing assets, right? Income-producing assets, things that buy my time back. Okay, an asset that buys my time back, like the real estate, seller finance real estate. We work with a company called Equity and Help. Okay, one of my favorite real estate investments. It is my favorite real estate investment. Uh, and, and with that being said, I've got an actual property and I'm going to hit this really quick because I said I would. I've got an actual property that I'm in full control of that pays me income every month with a real person living in it and a mortgage payment coming in. Okay, I want to take a slight detour. Slight detour because I told this story and I didn't finish it. So I said last year I lost the money and I and I wanted to go over again. This is the the education part, right? So investing means to clothe your capital. Clothe your capital. Okay, so clothe your capital. So you clothe capital just like for me, I would clothe myself. So I have always taught I would only invest or wear clothes, like clothe my capital or my own body with things that I like, things that I understand, things that fit me, things that fit my goals or purposes, or we could say my use, if they fit the thing I'm going to use it for. I would not wear a snowsuit to the beach because I'm not using that at the beach. I need shorts, right? Um, so like, understand, fit me, fit my goals. They're vital, not overpriced. And I thought this was it. I was like, okay, these, these few points, I like it. I understand it. It fits me. It fits my use. It fits my, my goals. It's vital. It's not overpriced. And then the final one that I had to look at is I control. How much control do I have? Okay, the things I lost money in last year, I didn't have much control. Did I like them? Yeah. Did I understand them? Probably not as well as I thought I did. Okay, understanding involves control, right? So I like it, I understand it. And this is another part of it is knowledge of. That's part of the understanding, like this knowledge and understanding. I'm actually gonna put this up here. Where does that come from? That comes from learning. It comes from studying. So if I'm not making financial progress, one of the first questions I would ask you is, when's the last time you studied about money? If the answer is not recently, that's the reason you're not making financial project progress. I can't make progress on something if I don't study, if I don't know anything about it, right? So I've got to like the investment. I've got to understand the investment. It's got to fit me as an investor, my personality, my, 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 my style of investing. Okay, it's got to fit my uses. What am I using it for? It's got to be vital. It can't be overpriced and it needs to be something that I control. Okay, and if I have all of these points in, then I'm very excited to invest. 
If I'm not excited to invest, it's because I'm missing something. Okay. And then there's no incentive to save. Right. This is the final piece is I would never save for no reason. I would never save for an emergency. Right. When I was a Dave Ramsey advisor, we tell people save your emergency fund. I hated that. I don't want to save for the purpose of having an emergency. Like it's like I'm 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 future funding an emergency. Like, you know how you how you fund college for your kids, you fund retirement. It's because you plan on retiring or you plan on having your kids go to college. Funding an emergency means I'm planning on having an emergency. I don't want to plan on having an emergency. I don't want to be that person where my fridge breaks. My money goes first, then my actions and my realities follow where my money goes. If I set money aside for an emergency, guess what I'm going to create? I'm going to create an emergency to use that money for. Right? I didn't like saving for a rainy day. That doesn't even make sense. Right? Did you know that that's actually from a government war bonds campaign? They were saying invest in, in, in war bonds so that we can rain missiles down on the people who live on the wrong countries. I don't want to finance that. I'm not saving for that. So I need to know why am I saving? I get excited about I'm saving so that I can improve my condition as a spiritual being. That excites me. I want to save money for that. I'm saving so that I can get a dope new bed. That's exciting. I want to save money for that. I want to save so I can get a new vehicle. That's exciting. I want to save for that. I want to save so that I never have the obligation of trading time for money again, and I'm financially independent for the rest of my life, and I can spend my time, my energy, my creativity doing the things I want to do, regardless of whether they bring money in or not. That's exciting. That's why I want to save. The way I'm going to get there is investing. That last one does not happen if I don't invest in income producing assets. So if I don't have that as a purpose, I'm not going to save. I'm not going to have the know-how to do it. I'm not going to go learn. So as I'm wrapping this up, and I do want to leave this some time for questions, um, as I'm wrapping this up, that has to be the thing we focus on. What's the end game? Every single one of you on this webinar, you should know the amount of monthly passive income you would need to have in order to be financially independent, to no longer trade time for money. Okay, that number should cover 40% of your savings, your living expenses. And I'm not talking about top ramen and beans. I'm talking about in an ideal scene. You live in the house you want to live. You eat organic. You travel the frequency you want to travel. You go out with your family the amount of times you want to go out. You treat money like oxygen. You don't think about it. If you want to spend, you spend. If you bring an in income, you bring an in income. It's not a consideration for you. So that's the expenses and then taxes. Savings, expenses, and taxes should be covered by passive income. If I don't know that number, that's the target. If I don't know that number, then I don't have a purpose for investing. And if I don't have a purpose for investing, I don't have a purpose for saving. And if I don't have a purpose for saving, I don't have a purpose for earning. And if I don't have a purpose for earning, then I don't have a purpose for investing in financial education to learn about money that I don't have. Right? Why am I going to learn all this to never apply it? You see what I mean? So guys, I'm going to open this up for questions really quick at the end. Um, very quickly, I know I went a little long. I do want to bring my book back up. Um, if you've not gotten a copy of my book and we helped you today, if I said something that inspired you, if I said something that you know was new for you and it was valuable, I want you to go, go to jerryfetta.com forward slash B2F promo and you can get a free copy of my book. With that book, Rodrigo Torres on my team will reach out to you for a free coaching call. Okay, so I want you to grab that. The second thing I want to tell you about is uh, we have a webinar coming up with Tax Hive. Okay, Tax Hive is my partner tax firm. It's owned by Mr. Kevin O'Leary, uh, Mr. Wonderful himself. You guys have probably seen him on TV here and there. Um, but Kevin O'Leary is my 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 partner in the in the firm tax firm. We work with them on tax planning, tax filing, um, and so we're glad to have that partnership. But they're going to be having a webinar with us. That's going to be on Wednesday. Make sure I have my my dates correct here. Wednesday, February eighth at 6.30 p.m. Eastern time, okay? So if you are starting 2023 and you're like, hey, I want to lower my taxes. I don't want to pay as much money to the IRS. I want you to reach out to my team. You can reach out to Joe or to Rodrigo or to Kevin Estaleo on this webinar, uh, and you can ask for the link for that, and you can register. Okay, that's completely free to register. We're going to be going over some great material on how to reduce your taxes, real actionable stuff, okay? So again, grab the book, register for the webinar, um, if you've not messaged Rodrigo Torres, I want you to check your chat. Okay, Rodrigo Torres is on my team. He's going to be reaching out to you. He already probably has sent you a couple messages. Um, so be sure you check your chat. 
Um, let me check the chat here as well. Lawrence, good to see you. Larry, good to see you. Uh, Joe, Ian. Uh, Tarek James says, glad to be here for a change. Good to have you on here, Tarek. Um, we're glad to see you as well. Rod says, can you make me a panelist? I tried to, Rod. Let me see if I can do it again. All right, um, let's see here. So yes, if you've not set up a time to, to do a coaching call with Rodrigo Torres, I want you to reach out to Rod. If Rod sent you a message, you can get his calendar booking link, okay? Um, and you can schedule a time with them. Um, Ian says we need to reschedule. So that's totally fine. Ian, Ian reach out to Samantha. Um, and just let her know you need to reschedule today's call. So Ian's doing a call with me, uh, a one-on-one -on -one 60 minute coaching call. I did this with Nick Bracey already because they were our top trained clients. Okay. So, um, Ian was number two in the entire company for 2022, huge deal. That means that he spent the second most time of all of our clients. We have over 2000 clients guys, the second most time of all of our clients all over the globe training and learning about money. Okay, Nick was third, top three people. Andrew Davis was first. So with that, I rewarded them with an hour-long coaching call with me. Uh, we did one with Nick already, and it was just complete fire. Amazing call. Uh, so I'll be doing with one with Ian as well soon, too. All Brianna says, I want out of Alaska for sure. It's a challenge. I'm still saving 40%, but I got to get up the income. That's awesome. So guys, Brianna um, lives in Alaska. That's where I'm from. Um, you know, I've moved. It's, it's, for me, it was great. I, I love Alaska, but it's a fun place for me to visit. I lived there for 20 years. So I was kind of done on it, right? But um, she's right now saving 40% of her income, right? And I can tell you, she's not doing her dream job at this point in time. She's working on getting there. She got licensed with us to become an ambassador, and she's working on building a business with Wealth Dynamics, but doesn't matter. She's still saving 40%, right? It's how bad do you want it? Like, like, am I going to do it in a way that's expedient and I just get, get the thing done, even if it's not ideal? Or I'm going to say, oh, I need the perfect job and the perfect time and the perfect boss and the perfect coworkers. Like, I'm almost 90% positive, and Brianna can, can confirm this. Uh, one of her jobs is, is, I think, shoveling dog poop. Like, I did pizza, not glamorous, but it brings an income. And that's, that's what I admire and respect about her is you roll your sleeves up and get it done. There's zero excuse there. At one point, I was able to quit the pizza job that I hated and build my business and do that full time. But until then, I was like, yeah, I'm going to deliver pizza. Okay, I didn't love my coworkers. I didn't love my boss. I didn't love the shifts. I was driving around at five in the morning in Wasilla, Alaska. Okay, nothing good happens at five in the morning in Wasilla, Alaska. Nick says, is that gross or rent? So that's 40% of your gross income, Nick, not the net income. Uh, Mariah says, so the Roth IRAs are just bad, I'm guessing. So Mariah, the Roth IRA is not necessarily bad. Um, and set up a call with Rod for this. So between a Roth and a sacred account, I would pick the sacred account. The Roth, you put money in after tax, you pull it out tax-free when you're 60. The sacred account, you put money in after tax, you pull it out tax-free anytime you want. With the Roth, you got to wait till you're 60. With the sacred account, you don't. With the Roth, you're forced to invest in Wall Street financial products. That's what I don't like about the Roth IRA. I don't want to put money with Wall Street. So when I do that plan, it forces me to put money with Wall Street. Now, there is something we offer called a self-directed IRA. A self-directed IRA allows me to get all the benefits of a retirement plan without being forced to give the money to Wall Street. Um, that's awesome. Ian said his daughter does Wealth Dynamic University three hours daily. She's four. Ian, you should talk to Rodrigo about the sacred account junior. Okay. Many people don't know this. If you have kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, little siblings, you can actually set up a sacred account for them. Right. This is so powerful. Right. I went over this before. We don't have enough time to cover it today. But um, Chris Noggle, one of my partners, he set up a sacred account for his daughter. I'm about to set one up for my godson. And guys, it's literally going to cover for his daughter's illustration her college, her wedding, the down payment for her house, college for her kids, and then 90 grand a year in retirement for like 30 years. And there's still going to be millions of dollars left over. And she's not even pulling it out to invest in real estate. She's just leaving it there. Imagine if she pulled it out to invest in real estate as well, right? So when you take a four-year-old and you say, good, we're going to start doing a sacred account. You can do these 
with someone that's as old as 14 days old, as long as they're 14 days old and have a social security number, you can set up a sacred account for them. Um, so that's something that I would recommend looking into. Um, Rod has a good point. So for those of you that are interested, um, so we have the Tax Hive webinar, and that's going to be on this, or sorry, February 8th, right? This Thursday, not the 8th, this Thursday, 6.30 p.m., I'm doing an ambassador rally. So for those of you that are interested in earning income with Wealth Dynamics, you want to get licensed with us to do the sacred account. You want to help people, you know, become financially literate and learn the truth about money and break free from the banks and Wall Street and IRS and build financial independence. I'm going to teach you how to do that Thursday at 6 p 6 30 p.m. Reach out to Rodrigo Torres to get on that webinar. Uh, I'm disabled in home all day and have time to do something online to make a stream of income. Any thoughts? Steven, there's so many options for that. So I would pick one that you know you can do um, and just get it done, especially if you've got a lot of time for it to learn. Yeah, Brianna says, yeah, yeah. So guys, like that's, that's, like, she confirmed it. She's not, this the, the job she has is not her dream job, just like I said with the pizza. Uh, guys, again, uh, reach out to Rod Torres if you'd like to schedule a call. Looks like Matt connected with them. Marshall says, I'm 62. Is it too late? Definitely not, Marshall. We can help. Um, with 62, what I would say is it might take a little bit more of, of uh, income and savings to put towards building wealth just because you're you're compressing the time, right? So if I'm older and I'm like, hey, I want to be done soon. I waited a long time. I can still do it. I've just got to, I've got to make up. I've got to make up for what I haven't been doing if I haven't started just yet. So it's doable, right? I think the, the you know, uh, Colonel Sanders KFC, I think he got started in like his 70s, right? So, so it's something you definitely can do. So Marshall, connect with Rodrigo. Mariah, thank you for clarifying because I wonder if I can do one for my two kids. Yep, so Mariah, set up a call with Rod. Rod, if you want to reach out to Mariah, uh, Mariah, you definitely could set up a sacred account for your kids uh, James asks, what is tier two and tier three? Okay, that's my bad. I said we do tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is the life insurance, okay? Tier two is gold, okay? Physical gold, not ETFs, not gold tokens, actual gold. Um, with gold, it's very similar to the sacred account. I can buy physical gold. I can actually build it up, lease it out for income so it earns interest like a sacred account does. It's tax-free like a sacred account. I can borrow against it, right? So that's something I can do with gold. That's tier two. Tier three is real estate. I can borrow against real estate similarly. These are all very real proven stores of value. Ian says for licensing, do I want to do health and life or just health? Um, Ian, for now, do just life, just the life insurance exam. We can always add the health insurance later. Kevin posted the tax hive link. So to register for the tax hive webinar, um, this is going to be the link. So again, the tax hive webinar is going to be uh, February 8th at 6.30 p.m. That's a Thursday. Uh, and that's going to be a webinar with myself and with Chris Brown from Tax Hive, not Chris Brown, the rapper. There was actually some confusion last time we did a webinar with him. People are like, you're doing a webinar with Chris Brown? I was like, not that Chris Brown. Uh, so register for the webinar. That's going to be again on the 8th at 630. And that is a webinar that's going to be solely focused on helping you lower your taxes. Awesome. That's all the questions I see there. Let me check one more time. Keith asks, why do you want or need multiple sacred accounts? Good question. So Keith, you would open up multiples for a number of reasons. The first one would be if I maxed out the first one. Um, the tax company on February 8th, that's going to be Tax Hive. Tax Hive. Um, again, that's owned by Kevin O'Leary. Um, so you would own one because you've maxed out the sacred account you have already, right? So that's going to be the first reason. The second one is to maybe uh, diversify our performance. Maybe I want to say, okay, I've got one with Guardian. I also want one with One America. I want one with Lafayette Life. I want one with um, Penn Mutual. And I want to just see who does the best. All of them are going to be good. All of them ultimately do the same thing, right? So um, that's something I could set up and say, okay, good. I want to maybe compete them against each other, right? But most of the time it's going to be, I maxed out the primary and now I need to open up another. Ian asks, after I fund my sacred account enough to start paying off my consumer debt, how long does it take to request a loan against your account and have the money deposited Good question. So the first loan is going to take about two weeks. Okay. Um, so two weeks or so. And that's because there's some paperwork and just establishing your bank connection. After that, um, a loan can take a couple of days, right? Like it's usually pretty quick from there. T 
Timothy asks, if I set up a sacred account on my child, will I keep ownership of it until I die or will it transfer to them at a certain age? So Timothy, you could do both, either or, right? So you could do either one of those. It's up to you. Um, reach out to our team and we can help you decide and structure that. Um, the other option is you could have it owned by a family trust. And then that trust owns and controls it. It could be used for the benefit of your child. Anna says, I'm building a house right now. What is the best way to pay it faster? Um, so Anna, there's a couple of things that we'd want to clarify. Reach out to Rodrigo Torres, Anna. Set up a call with Rod on my team and he'll be able to go through a little bit more strategy and also get some info from you that we'd want to know before we really could go over the best way. Um, but reach out to Rod and he's going to help him out. He's going to help you out with that. Um, good questions. Okay, so Brianna said, I made my first premium payment last March and borrowed 73% of the payment in the week to pay off a card. That's awesome. That's very fast. Michael asks, where is the tax I've read webinar? Um, so that's in the in the comments, Michael, if you check the chat here and Kevin can repost that again fresh. So you have that there. Keith says, so max is 1 million. Um, no, the maximum on a sacred account is not 1 million. So the max is generally going to be uh, about 25% of your income. So if your income keeps growing, you can keep putting more in. Ian says, I haven't used any credit cards to pay for anything in almost five months. Basically, since I joined, I should be out of credit card debt by the end of the year. That is awesome. Yeah, very well done, Ian. That's a great testimony to, to really, I mean, he did the work, but we gave him the data and he ran with it. And that's 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 the kind of uh, success stories that we see day in and day out here. Okay, guys, so we're going to wrap up here for today. Um, I do want to just check Facebook quickly and see if there was any questions that came up. And um, again, if you're watching this and you are not registered for our Tax Hive webinar and our ambassador rally, I want you to do that now. Um, and that way you can start to get an understanding of taxes, right? How do I reduce my taxes and how do I earn more income? All right, I do see some questions and comments here on Facebook. All right, so Facebook, any recommendations for starting a tie-dye business in Alaska this summer? I don't have any expertise in tie-dye. Sorry about that. Haven't filed taxes in four years or or haven't filed taxes in four years getting back on track. Yep, so I would get that handled with a CPA probably. Um, Awesome. Those are all the questions I see on Facebook. So guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, log out here. I will leave Rodrigo in, char in charge here so you guys can um, set up a call with him. Yeah, so the link here just got posted again for the tax side webinar. Um, and then I want you to keep an eye open on Monday. So Monday, we're doing something special. We're going to be posting a video series every Monday called Mini Moguls. Okay, Wealth Dynamics Mini Mogul Monday. It's going to be with my godson and I, Sammy. He's 11 years old, and we're going to be talking about finances. And a couple things that we're going to focus on is educating Sammy. He's a kid, right? And so with a kid, like oftentimes it's funny, adults understand the same stuff better when it's explained to them like a kid. And that's going to be an easy way for someone that's newer to learn about finances. The second one is if you have children, you have kids, you've got grandkids, you've got nieces, nephews, siblings that you want them to learn about finances that's a great thing to have them tune into. Sammy's 11. He's going to be helping teach some of this stuff. Um, I keep seeing that there's no link for tax hive in the chat. There definitely is. Let me post it here to everyone. And I'll post this in the Q&A as well. Yeah. So, um, and if you don't get the link, I want you to just reach out to Rod. So again, Monday afternoon, keep an eye out for that on our Facebook page. We'll probably drop that at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Monday. Mini moguls uh, with Sammy. Um, otherwise, guys, have a great weekend. I do have to get on to my next calls and appointments. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you didn't yet set up a sacred account, talk to Rod. Okay, I call him the Rod Father. Talk to Rod, get your sacred account set up. Uh, get the, the like I said, the bad financial groups out of your life. To get them out, you got to have a place to go instead. If I don't have a sacred account to set up to go instead, I'm going to stay with banks because I don't have anywhere else to go. Right? I'm going to leave you with that. Have a happy Saturday. Talk to you next time.